Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where you focus on the people part of your business. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And it's very rare, very rare, that I have a guest on twice. I try to keep it fresh. I try to mix it up for you guys. But sometimes they're just someone that offers such pearls and the feedback the first time was so good that I caved. And I've had the uh, the good judgment to invite back to the program Michael Watkins. Now, before I introduce Michael, let me tell you a bit about him because he is, uh, uh, as I told you the first time, I'm a bit of a fanboy, which I know is extremely nerdy. I've read every word he's ever written. And he's probably best known for the best-selling book, The First 90 Days, which we talked about in the last session. Over a million copies sold, translations to 24 languages. In addition to being a professor at IMD on leadership, which is one of the top MBA programs in business schools in the world, in space in Switzerland, uh, and previously professor at Harvard, he's also somehow managed to write 11 books. I don't know how he does it. But today we're going to focus on his newest writing, which is called Your Next Move. And it's really a great uh, uh, compendium. And, and it works in conjunction with the first 90 days. So those two books really go together. And Michael's going to explain what that means and how it works. And you're going to get a ton out of the next 20 minutes because we're going to talk about how you get your new hires up and running as fast as possible, which I know is a huge issue for many of you. So with all that said, Michael, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Jeff. It's great to have you on. And uh, I guess to start, why don't we just start with what your next move, the book, is all about, kind of how it works in conjunction with the first 90 days. And then we'll talk about some of the very specific situations that some of our listeners may find themselves in. Terrific, Jeff. So, so the first 90 days when I wrote it was really kind of my attempt to create a set of general principles that anyone going through any transition in the entire universe um, could apply successfully to get up to speed in half the time, right? That was the basic logic of distill it all down into, you know, this essential set of principles like accelerate your, your learning or securely wins, um, you know, but I was basically saying, look, it's a one size fits all, right? It works everywhere. It's the universal, you know, set of truths about transition. Fantastic, right? And then I did something that only like an academic can love. I said, well, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> you know, all transitions are actually different, right? Yeah. You know, there's, there's all these edge there's, cases, right? There's all these, these kind of differences and ways that things work differently. And so, you know, so I, I basically said, okay, let, let's really focus in on the distinct types of transitions that most leaders go through at some point in their career. Mm -hmm. Often they go on and go through multiple ones in parallel. And let's really deep dive into those and say, okay, what, you know, what's hard about those how do you apply the principles, you know, differently depending on which of those you're encountering or which mix you're encountering? And that was really the impetus to start doing the research for Master Your Next Move, as it, as it now is called. It's kind of just been- really Master amazing. Your Next Move. Yeah. So, so this is one that I think a lot of our listeners probably have to think through. Maybe they've dealt with it on their own. And that is promoting someone from within versus hiring someone from the outside. So let's use a real life example. So- Let's say one of our listeners runs a business or a department, and in one scenario, they hire someone from the outside. They need to get them ramped up and onboarded as smoothly, as quickly as possible. Scenario two is they promote some, someone from within into that role. There's obviously got to be some differences in how you think about onboarding and getting someone up to speed in those two scenarios, right? Maybe you could help us understand Absolutely. the juxtaposition. No, and it's the, those are perfect examples, right? Because they're classic examples of distinct types of transitions where the demands on the leader are extremely different. Yep. What they share is the fact that the hiring manager has a huge stake in getting that person up to speed faster and better, right? Yep. And I don't think people actually understand the degree to which the hiring manager has a, a profound impact on these people. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. But let's take each one of these in turn, Jeff. So, so onboarding. You know, there's a basic assumption, I think, that you're hiring someone probably laterally in terms of level. You know, they were the VP of X where they were, and now they're the VP of X where they are. Yep. So they're not really needing to kind of learn to operate at a higher level, but they need to learn to operate in the context of your organization. 
So this was the outside hire, right? Yeah, it was the, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. The on, yep. the, we call this the onboarding challenge. Okay. Coming the outside. So they don't know your business. They don't know your culture. They don't know your team. But they probably know the function and the skills, right? Exactly. And that's yep. what, you, what you brought them in for, right? You needed a really great VP finance. Okay, yep. you went out into the marketplace. You found this great VP finance. And now they're bringing us in, them into you know, this beautiful company that you yep. have built. And they've got to become effective in that company. So. What they don't need to learn typically is more about finance. Yeah. What they don't typically need to learn about is more about how to make decisions. What they need to learn is how do things get done here, right? What's the culture and the history of this place? What are the key relationships that I really need to build? Who, you know, who are the allies that I need to cultivate to really get things done? And cultures, as I know you this well dramatically from company to company, right? You can have a, a company where the culture is very um, sort of consens consensus yep. driven. You yep. can have um, cultures where there could be, Jeff, I'm getting instability on the internet. Um, still let's there? see, I'm here, I'm here. Why don't we stop yep. the video and just keep going with audio, it might help, okay? You're frozen, unfortunately. Yep. Can you hear me? Michael? Michael, can you hear me? Michael? Michael? Michael. Can you hear me? Michael. Hey, Michael. Michael? Michael? Hey, Jeff. I'm not sure what happened there. It's okay. No worries. So what? I, we can edit it together. What I was going to suggest is let's turn the video off and it'll free up a lot of bandwidth. Yep. You know how to do that? Just hit the vid stop video button. Yep. Just give me a sec. Okay. How's that? Can you still... Hear me? I, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Great. And we'll edit it together. So no problem. So just pick up where you left off. Okay. Um, so in dealing with somebody coming into your company from the outside, yep. what you really need to focus on is helping them get up to speed with your culture, the way things get done here, right? The history of how things have come to be where they need to be. Yep the critical relationships that they need to build and the alliances that they need to form. You can't expect them to just know these things when they come into a new organization. Absolutely not. They're on a big learning curve. And if they know what they're doing, they're focusing very much on that. Why are they focusing on that? Because there's lots of good research. The most recent study I saw was done by Egon Zender that says the reason why people fail when onboarding has nothing to do with their ability to deal with stress, their yep. decision-making capability, their industry knowledge. It's all about the culture and politics. Yep. Yep. And so you should be tuning your onboarding process to really help someone, you know, learn those things faster and integrate more deeply and quickly into the organization. And it's particularly challenging, Jeff, because everyone else is busy, right? They're doing all this stuff that, you know, they're fully up to speed and going. And then this new person kind of arrives. Yep. Do they feel like they have any responsibility for getting that person up to speed? Do they give that person a chance to, to get up to speed? Does the hiring manager give them the right sort of understanding of how fast they need to move? Is there a window for their, them to learn in? These are really critical things that can make or break uh, an outside hire. And in relatively small to medium-sized companies, having a failed hire at a senior level can be devastating. Ticket, ticket just catastrophic for a growth stage company. And I think on top of that, we probably waited too long to hire the person anyway. So now we're desperate. We go through this process. We hire someone that we think is a rock star. So we say, well, they don't need help getting onboarded or learning our culture. They're, they're, a, they're a quick study. And so we put them in. And then by day two, we show them where the bathroom is. We say, good luck. And they're, you're now onboarded, right? Absolutely. I call this the sink or swim approach to onboarding, yeah. right? Or <laughs> right. Like I, I call it leadership development through Darwinian evolution. Yep. You know? And unfortunately, it goes wrong. Premise. It goes wrong a lot. Absolutely. The basic premise is so completely flawed, right? The notion that you can't do things to help someone get up to speed faster and better is just crazy, right? Yep. And you have a huge stake in making that happen. But you still see leaders, and I know you've seen them too, Jeff, where there's kind of just what you said, right? You're a leader, go lead, right? When the going yep. gets tough, the tough get going. Yep. As, as we have suffered, so shall ye, right? Whatever your favorite kind of metaphor is for this. And, it's, and it, I just never understand why people think that that's a good idea. Now, let's contrast that 
with a promotion from within. I'm, I'm assuming it's the opposite, right? They know the culture, they know the business, but they may not have this, all the skills to do the job. Is it that simple or am I underestimating it? It's, that's a big chunk of it, okay? And, and by the way, when you say it's that simple, it doesn't mean it's simple to do, right? right. Because simple but not easy, right? Yeah, and there's a few subtleties to it that I think are worth focusing on, right? So the good news is they understand a lot about your organization, mm -hmm. right? The good news is they know who the key players are. They know the culture to at least some degree, although they've not operated at that level before. And it can be different at that level, you know? And so part of what needs to happen is they need to figure out how to step up and operate as an executive at a different level than they've done that previously. And that means maybe delegating differently, communicating differently, literally showing up with presence differently. And that's not a small thing. That's not a small leap, Jeff, to make. Uh, yeah. yeah, on Friday, they're director of marketing, managing two people. And on Monday, they're VP of marketing, managing 30 people. And it's the same person. Exactly. And by the way, there's a good news, bad news thing around this as well, right? Because often they're leading people who are formerly their peers, Gosh. right? And, yep. you know, this is not easy, right? Yep. Because those people think they know you, they know you in that role, right? But they may feel, you know, like they're really colleagues to you and not be so comfortable with you being their manager. They may have wanted the job, right? And be a disappointed competitor. And so there's a lot of complexity with those kinds of uh, promotions and people can really stumble. And, it, and it's around things like how, you know, how do I demonstrate my authority in a deft, yep. you know, sensible way, yep. not come on too strong, but not continue to be super peer, right? right. It's, it's there's some very delicate balances. And as leader, it's our responsibility to ensure that the newly promoted person that we've promoted does these things appropriately and integrates into the new role appropriately. We can't just, again, what was your term, Michael, uh, sink or swim? Uh, because if they sink, now we got a real problem. We've promoted someone who was one of our proven star performers. We throw them into a new pool, right? Get out of the, get out of the, get out of the hot tub and get into the swimming pool and they sink. Now we got a real problem. Absolutely. Right. And, and I think again, just, you know, starting with the, the, premise and understanding that you have a huge stake in getting these people up to speed faster and oh by the way there's a lot you can do yeah and you know as the hiring manager again what good research shows about this is you know you are the one who has the biggest impact of anybody on whether that person successfully onboards into the new uh, role or not right you, you are you are the one that's going to have the biggest impact. And you're also, by the way, a busy person who may think, ah, I don't have time to do this stuff with this, you know, new hire. And, you know, as you said earlier, Jeff, the, the assumption is that, you know, they, they know how to do things, right? And they should be able to be fully capable, you know, from, from, from the word go. And it just doesn't happen to work that way. So we're not going to solve it completely on this, on this podcast, Right. Obviously, it's not just not realistic that we're going to solve it. But let's just talk about one specific thing. Give us one very tangible thing that we need to do or not do when we do that internal promotion. Well, the internal promotion for sure is, first of all, help that person step up into the role. You know, they're now part of a leadership team probably, right, that's reporting to you if mm -hmm. you're the leader of the organization. They may yep. never have been with a leadership team before in that way, right? Yep. They're learning how to function. So make sure they're welcomed, right? Have your team understand that they have a stake and that you're expecting them to help this leader be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's a, that, you know, if there's nothing else you do, that's a, that's a critical piece. You know, any coaching you can provide on the margin for them, hugely beneficial, right? Yep. To really help them, you know, step up into that new role because they're on a big learning curve and you need to recognize that. And what do I do when I sense those peers who now report to this per former peers who now report to this person? If I sense any of that cat, that cattiness, I guess you'd say, how short a, a, a few should I have for tolerating that? Is that to be expected? Do I make it clear from day one that it's not going to be tolerated? What, what do I do? So, so there's a very limited amount you can do with the person, the people who are reporting to the leader that you've promoted, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it, you know, to get in underneath them is to disempower them at a pretty profound level, right? So you've got to be really careful about doing that. Yep. What you do need to do is be supportive 
of them saying, you know, just just not working out, right? He's yep. not able to kind of get over it and 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 work for me. He's a good guy. On balance, we should be wanting to to, to keep him, but he's mm-hmm. not able to make the leap to do this. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to have to let this guy go. Mm-hmm. And and when you hear that, you're going to have to say, right, with other judgments that you make and other information. Okay, right, I get it. Right, yeah. I understand. I support you in in doing that. Um, now, you know, the leader themselves, there's so much that they need to do when they're in that situation to try and, I say, re-enlist the good people, right? Because, you know, you don't want to lose good people if you don't have to, right? And if, so if there are things you can do to re-enlist them, you can take a disappointed competitor and say, look, Jeff, you know, I'm really stand for your development, right? I'm going to help you get to the next level. Yep. Because career concerns are the biggest things that are going through people's heads when these things happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so the moral of the story on that example, and then we're going to switch to another one, is do not try to onboard new hires the same way you think about onboarding promoted hires. Two completely different situations. Absolutely. Right. And, and as long as you recognize that, you can do things, you know, not costly things, time or otherwise, on the margin that can have a dramatic impact in helping that person get up to speed faster. I think you said in the first uh, podcast that we recorded last year that you've seen uh, the ability to cut it in half the amount of time that it takes to ramp up someone. Is that right? Absolutely. We've got lots of good research that, that shows that you can reduce the time to full performance by 50% if you which do the right would, things. Which would be amazing. Let's use one more example before we wrap up of a very specific type of situation that you see uh, get people in trouble. I know the book lays out eight. Maybe you could pick one that you think is. Yeah. Particularly so so my, 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 my favorite, my absolute favorite is, you know, sticking with what you know, right? The biggest mistake people make when coming into new roles is not understanding that, you know, the demands of the new role are going to require some learning and adaptation on their part. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, there's a trap I see people fall into, you know, people like the people, you know, leading your companies who, you know, they're going out to recruit someone, they really want them, right? So they tell them, you know, we need you to do exactly what you're doing at your last company, but here, you know, and, 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 you know, you're perfect. And, and, you know, and, and they come in and, and they try to do things like that. And they quickly find that there's nuances, there's, you know, the job is a bit different than perhaps they were led to completely believe. Yep. You know, my, my joke about this is, you know, uh, onboarding is so hard because recruiting is like romance and employment is like marriage. <laughs> Two very different things, right? Yeah. You know, dur- during the recruiting process, we're falling in love, right? Sure. Everything is great. Yeah. Everything's easy. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll always do the dishes and I really like your mother, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, but then there's the cold, harsh light of cohabitation, right? And, yeah. and so, so, you know, what you need to do as a hiring manager is make sure that once that person's on board, they're really clear about what their mandate is. They're really clear about what they need to do. They're really clear about whose you know, relationships they need to build, how they're going to get early wins, so that there, there's no misalignment, right? There's, right. No, there's no misunderstanding about the foundations of what they're there to do. It's almost like a, uh, a contract. You know when you sign a contract, it kind of says – Everything we've discussed and all verbal representations are superseded by this document. It's kind of what you're saying, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Now you're here. Forget about all that stuff we talked about in the sales process. The now we need past to is prologue. Exactly. Let's, now, let's to be, look to the future. To be fair, you're going to cause yourself a world of hurt if you oversell the position or oversimplify it. Uh, so I think you know, the more transparent you can be in the recruiting process, the less sur- ugly surprises you're going to have with a candidate. That, that's, that's absolutely true, Jeff. But even so, people can get a sense that they're expected to do X, right? And, and yeah. through no one's misrepresentations, right? And they come in and it's just not quite right. And, and, sure. But they try, they plow ahead trying to do it and, and they get themselves into some significant trouble. For example, I saw a situation recently with a search that we led where part of the role genuinely was to think about new products and new product pipeline. But that was not the first priority. That was kind of six months down the road. So it wasn't misrepresented in the search. And we talked to this individual that this was part of the job, but he needed to understand that sequentially, you know, that was kind of going to start six months from now after we, you know, do some basic housekeeping and launch a new product that was already in the pipeline. 
Absolutely. It's a great example, right? And the, and the reason why that person took the job probably because it was because they were really excited about the, the product development piece. Exactly. Right? And exactly. so they get on board and they're not able to do it and they get disappointed. Yep. You know, and, and this is a great example because the right answer is to say, look, we're going to get there, right? You're going to get there, but first we need you to do X, Yep. you know, and, and, you know, dig in for six months, but I promise you we're going to, we're going to get there, right? But we need to lay some foundations first. One last question before we wrap up, Michael, how do you know when you've made a mistake in the onboarding process and you're getting clues that this, this person you just hired or promoted is not getting it? Uh, no, I just totally doesn't translate. It's funny, I'm going through one of these right now where I'm watching someone who is in the process of failing and probably about to be mm. let go, right? And I think, um, I'm assuming that you are doing a great job of helping your clients find people who have the right capabilities and are capable of the right fit. Yep. Yeah? Yep. So, so then, you know, if it's not working, the odds are not bad that it's because they weren't onboarded particularly well. They've gotten into some initial stumbles. They, they've got into a bit of a vicious cycle. That's a moment when you intervene and say, stop, you know, <laughs> let's take stock here. Let's try to restart this. You know, you can do those, those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, the, the danger is that, and this is why I got interested in transitions in the first place, right, is that early mistakes are costly, very costly, just like early successes are so powerful, right? If yep. you dig yourself into a hole early on, it can be virtually impossible to dig yourself out. So don't let your new hires dig themselves. And how long do this you... This is wait? another key point, by the way. Often... Oh, that's a, that's a high situational thing. But, but one, one thought before, before that just is, yeah. Yeah. if you see things not going well, say something immediately, right? Yeah. There's this tendency to kind of, you know, give them some time to find their, you know, their feet and, oh, they need just a little, you know, no. Okay. Yeah. The single biggest thing I see happen that's negative in onboarding is not enough feedback early enough. Yep. And as a result, someone starts to go off track. And if they're too far off track, the odds of getting back on track are very low. Yeah, I think there's a hesitation to uh, to intervene. You know, we just hired someone. We want to give them some space and not cramp their exactly. style. And, and you're right. When you see something, say something. Absolutely. Michael, this has been fantastic. I cannot thank you enough for making the time. Master your next move, the essential companion to the first 90 days. Both wonderful must-read, must-read books. You can get them on Amazon or any place. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. How can people learn more about your, your practice, your advisory services, and get in touch with you? Sure. So, so our consulting company is Genesis Advisors with an ERS on the end. Um, we specialize in transition acceleration and developing onboarding journeys for organizations. My personal practice these days is, is coaching CEOs who are a mix of both what we talked about, Jeff, coming in yep. from the outside or, or being promoted inside. Fantastic. Michael, thank you so much. Congratulations on these huge contributions to, to the thinking around this important topic. Thank you, Jeff. Great to talk again.